Hey, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. There has been just a lot go on lately, and, and I want to just say that I'm impressed to see you here. I'm blessed to see you here. And so while we're here, let's make the most of being here and not focus on what I say, but focus on what the Word of God says. Amen? Amen. It, it does us no good to gather and assemble if our focus is on what I have to say versus what God has to say. And so I'm excited today to be in what I would call the book of all books in the Bible. It's called Acts. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 5 if you want to turn there. Acts chapter 5. And what we're going to talk about today is simply this. Our worldview will affect how we see everything. And how we view God will affect our worldview. For instance, if you have a worldly worldview, you will always see things from the world's point of view. But if you have a godly view, then you will see things through God's point of view. In order to get there, you'll have to go into the words of God. And whether we want to admit it today in 2020, the truth is every church is based off the first church, correct? The church of Acts. And the reason it's called Acts is that these are called the Acts of the apostles. This is what they did. This is how they physically lived. This is how they did life together. And this was the church. And they didn't meet in specific buildings. They met in homes. They met in courtyards, wherever they could. And they met daily. And their main focus was sharing the gospel of the risen Christ to all those who would listen. And so if you look at church today, it basically changes that whole format. We come to church because most of us in most churches come because we want to be served in some way rather than being the servant. And a lot of us will read the Word of God, a lot of us will hear the Word of God, and a lot of us will listen to the Word of God, but very seldom do we apply it, because when we apply it, it changes us. And so you can always tell who's living the Word and who's just hearing the Word, because it shapes and affects everything we do. I want you to know that when you are praising God on your own, I don't care if you're in your home, I don't care if you're in your bedroom, I don't care if you're driving down the road in the car. When you are praising God with all you've got, maybe a song comes on and you really like that song and you're just singing out to the Lord. I don't care if you hit a key at all. It sounds glorious to God. Amen. The sound of your knees hitting the ground going into prayer with God, it doesn't matter what you're saying, it is beautiful to the ears of the Lord. To worship, we are told, is to worship in truth and spirit. And I want to bring something to your attention today, that if we are ever going to be a church, an active, participating church, we must be devoted to the Word of God. And obedience to the Word of God is what unlocks the blessings of God. Now, keep in mind before I go any further, I'm not talking about worldly blessings. I'm talking about the blessings of heaven above from this transition, from this life into the next. And we are made in the image of God to be like God and to serve God through the word of God for the sake of his kingdom and bringing others to the knowledge and truth that is found only in Christ Jesus. Amen. And so today I want to share with you Acts chapter 5. We're not going to go through the whole chapter, but I want to point out some things about the chapter. Acts chapter 5, if you've ever been in Acts, we notice that Acts chapter 5 starts off with a story about Ananias and Sapphira. They lied to the Holy Spirit. We're not going to talk about that today, but I just wanted to let you know that that is where this is found in Scripture. And if you think you can get away with lying to people, go right ahead, but you will never lie to the Holy Spirit and you will never fool God. And you're on a slippery slope if you do so. Acts chapter 5, we're going to pick up in verse 12, and we're going to talk about the power of the church, what was going on in the church, and what it means to be devoted as the church. So follow along with me. I'm going to go through these scriptures. We're going to break them down as we go, because if I read all the way through it and go back through it, we might be here doubly long, and I figured, why not just explain it as we go? Why add to the Word of God? Why not just let the Word of God speak to us? So before we go into the scripture, let's pray. Father, today we are gathered here to do nothing but worship you, to praise your name, Lord. You have been so good to us, even when we did not deserve it. Your love, your grace, your mercy, and your kindness are very long and very long-suffering. 
Lord, forgive us where we fail you today. Open us to receive more, to believe more, to walk more in your word, to more in your will and more in your ways, not for our sake, but for your kingdom's sake. And out of our obedience, the glory of your name be known and captives be set free and the lost found. And all those would be redeemed by your blood today. In your name I pray. Amen. Verse 12, it says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. This is where they met daily. And it said many signs and wonders were done through what? The hands of the apostles. And so let's understand that being a part of a church means to be hands on. We're doing something. We have a servant mentorship that comes through God the Father, through Jesus Christ, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We are saved in a power to do the things that Christ showed us to do before he left. And he said to continue those until what? until he returns. So there is a responsibility and there's an accountability to being a disciple. And if you're here today and you haven't seen your hands been put to the use for the kingdom of God in a long time, I need you to revisit your prayer life and what God is asking you to do. Because to be stagnant and stale is to be disobedient to God. It says, none of the rest dared to join them, but the people esteemed them highly. There were people who would join with them, and the church was being added to We'll get to that in just a minute. But there were so many people that knew the power of God in these people, that if they weren't like them, they didn't get near them. I would like to just go ahead and address that if you live so rightly for God, you will have people who will no longer want to come around you. And when they do, they will come to you for prayer. You ever been around people, said they didn't believe in God, go through a tragedy, and you are the first person they come to and said, will you please pray? Yes. They may not believe, but they know you believe, and they know there's power in your belief. And something's holding them back. It may be this world may have blinded them. The spirit of this world may have blinded them. But the truth is about to come through. When you get hands on with people, and they revere you and know that you're a person of faith, you're a man or you're a woman of God, they will come to you and they will say, Say, will you pray for me? Will you pray about this? Will you pray with me? And when you say yes, declare it unto the Lord. Don't wait till later. Pray right then. Pray right there. Because yes. there ain't no better place to pray than right here, right now, to the one and only living God. Yes. Through Jesus Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit will answer. I promise you Amen. that. Live in such a way that people want to know what you've got and how you've got it. And so you can get the opportunity to do what? Tell them where they even found it. That's on the cross. It's in the empty tomb and it comes from heaven above. Amen. Verse 14, it said, Believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Now, I point this out simply because, remember back then, they only counted men. When we talk about feeding the 5,000, the 4,000, the gathering and assembly, they only counted men. The church was counting what? Men and women. You know why? They are equally important in the church. They are equally important in the body of God. Guess what, man? There are things that women can do in the ministry of Jesus Christ that you'll never be able to pull off. Women, know this. There are things about men in the ministry of Jesus Christ that they can pull off that you'll never be able to touch. It takes us both. That's why we are family. Y'all yes. remember that song, We Are Family? I won't sing it for you, but I know right now it's in your head, so you're welcome. They weren't just after men. They weren't just after what society said counted. They were after any whosoever who would believe. Amen. Yes. It says verse 15, So they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Now I don't know what you're casting when you're walking. I don't know what kind of life you live. I don't know what you do outside of here Monday through Saturday. I don't know. That's between you and the Lord. But let's look whose shadow they wanted to put their sick in. Peter. The same Peter who was hot-headed, ill-tempered, mouthed off, talked back, rejected and denied Christ, but who was restored, filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was empowered by God to go and complete the mission and task, which was what? Spread and share the gospel. They didn't even have to talk to Peter. They would lay sick in the street just so his shadow would be on them. 
To cast. Do you understand that you cast something every day? It's either light or it's darkness. It's either positive or it's negative. And those of us who are born again believers in Jesus Christ, purchased by the blood, who have been set free, and who are full of the Word of God because we are in it, we should be casting hope where there is no hope. Amen. We should be casting light where it is always dark. And we should always be willing to cast forgiveness where somebody has never known any. We should be a friend to the friendless. We should be a father to the fatherless. We should be a mother to the motherless. We are living hope like we just sang. Christ is our hope. We are the hope yes. to the rest of the world. Amen. So let me ask you, what are you casting today as you walk down the street? Is anybody trying to get in your way and say, hey, you care to pray for me? I know you're a praying person. I know you're a believer. I like this. I know you go to church. Did you know church isn't what changed me? Christ is what changed me. And because Christ changed me, I came to church. I didn't come to the building. I came to a body of believers because I know we are stronger and better together when we are one and we are united to be the call of Christ. And that's how the church of Acts acted out these things. Not solo, together. They had a support system. Some went out, some stayed in, some prayed up, some supported financially, some took care of the others. All of us have a place to serve in church. Verse 16, also a multitude gathered from their surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people to those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Notice it didn't say some were healed, it said what? They were all healed. Now, it said they were bringing them from the outside of Jerusalem. Did you realize when we are so dedicated and devoted to our praise and worship and obedience to God, not only does the miraculous happen, but word will spread and you will find people showing up where you are gathered to worship that ain't even from around here. The reason I know this is that we have people who go to this church who don't even live in Bowling Green. Why is that? Because they feel like they belong here. It ain't about how far you drive. It's when you get right with the Spirit, people will know that you've been in the presence of Jesus Christ. So it's very important as church members, as church goers, to not only be obedient, but live a life so modeled that people want to, want to know where you gather at because they want to see that same power, that same change, that same Spirit in their life. Yeah. Word travel fast when you're healing people. What happens when you don't get the physical healing? Guess what? You still get the spiritual healing. Amen. And the spiritual healing is what gets you into heaven. Verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation. And if you've got a pen right there, underline indignation or whatever your version says, and just write jealousy. Isn't it amazing how the main church people, the ones who supposedly knew it all, had it all together, got jealous of the apostles and what they were doing? Isn't it amazing when a church really gets going with the Spirit of God, really gets plugged in, tuned in, and focused on what God wants them to do, and they become active in serving the community and those around us, that you're always going to make somebody jealous or mad. Now, I can get it with kids. I get it with teenagers. Sometimes I get it with young adults. But you know what? There's some of us in this room. Once you've hit the age of 40 and over, you need to stop being jealous. Okay? You need to get that out of your system. But see, people that think they know it all think they know what? Know how to do it better. And they didn't like competition. Churches don't like competition either. Let somebody leave a church and come to your church, and then they'll get mad and say, what? You're stealing members from their church. That's absolutely not true. Sometimes people need to leave that church and go somewhere else because God is calling them. Sometimes God lets people leave churches because they don't belong there and maybe they're holding that church down. Do you ever think about that? If you've ever left and no one came after you, maybe they don't want you to come back. <laughs> and I say that with all love, grace, and mercy, but I remember, y'all may remember a guy. He used to be a preacher here. His name was Gary. can't remember his last name. Come on, that was a joke. Gary Beatty. I remember talking to him one time. This was back in the old building, before this building was even built. And I asked a question to him, and I said, hey, just to let you know, I'm having some issues at the church I'm at, and that it's been about six months, and no one's caught, called or checked on me or anything. You know what he told me? He said, why should they? You're the one that left. I, what, which one of y'all said that? <laughs> Terry, why don't you find out who that was? In all serious though, if you've left, there's a reason that you're leaving. Something's called you to go. And why would people chase you down? Because the scripture tells me that 
God is the one who leaves the 99 to find you, right? And we have to understand that sometimes God works on you and in you. And sometimes he pulls you away from the fold to get you closer to him to make you realize that maybe you were a hindrance there. Or maybe you weren't ready yet and you weren't doing what you're supposed to be doing. And whenever he empowers you and enables you and you either return or go somewhere else, guess what? You are even more activated than you were before. So it's not about the coming and going of members. It's about the coming and going of life. That ebb and flow of daily activity that church is not just Sunday morning at 1045. Church is every day in every way with everyone you come across with. And when that word spreads, you will automatically grow because people want to know, where are you going to get that light? I feel dark. Hey, come get you some light here at Meadowland. They were so jealous, it said in verse 18, they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in prison. Now we read earlier that our hands were to do the service of the Lord. Those who were jealous will lay their hands on you. I love the fact that being a Christian, we always say, I hope nothing bad ever happens to me. Or I hope nothing bad happens. I can promise you, if you are a Christian, there are some bad things going to happen to you. I don't know the timeline. I don't know the order of events. I don't know how quickly or how frequently they're going to happen. But when you follow Christ, some bad things are going to happen to you. Things you may not even be guilty of, but you'll be accused of. Don't worry, they did the same thing to Jesus. And if they did it to Jesus, guess what? They'll do it to you. They got put in prison for proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ. It said here, but at night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. And said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. I often think about how many people who believe in Jesus Christ who in some way, some form or fashion are still imprisoned every day. We, we think we're free because we believe God can set us free. But we've let, not let go of what makes us captive. We talk about freedom. We're still lying. We talk about freedom, but we're still manipulating people. We talk about freedom, but we're still dishonest. We talk about devotion, but we're not faithful in our marriages. We talk about being great parents, but we really don't spend quality time with our kids. We talk about being set free, but we're still addicted. Do you understand that when these apostles were set free, they were set free to spread the word, and that's what we are all called here to do today. And anything that interferes or intervenes that keeps you from sharing the gospel is a shackle on the chain that keeps you in prison. You can be physically walking the street free and still be shackled with a heavy load called sin. Jesus Christ came to set us free. And the Bible said those who are set free by the Son are what? Free indeed. So let us walk free. Let us breathe free. And you know what? Even if we're locked up in a physical prison, may it never hush our mouth to the one who can set us free. Amen. These are all times and things are coming that we may not be used to, we may not have been a part of before, but never worry about persecution. We're going to find out a little later what happened to these apostles. Verse 21. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those that were with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. And I don't know about you, they just got out of jail. And so you might have rethought, hey, you know, we just got arrested for this. Maybe we should give it a few days for what? For it to cool off and calm down. Y'all ever thought that way? Let's give it some time. Only to find yourself cooling off and calming down to the point where you never returned to what you were supposed to be doing in the first place. They didn't wait. It said they got up even though they were just out of prison. They got up early and went back to write what they were doing that they got arrested for. What they were persecuted for, it didn't stop them from doing what they were called to do. And it says... In verse 22, but when the officers came and did not find them in prison, they returned and reported, saying, Indeed, we have found the prison shut secure, securely, and the guards standing outside before the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. 
Wouldn't you have liked to have been the guards on duty that day, knowing that no one has came and gone, but nobody's in the cell anymore, and you're getting ready to be in big trouble because you've let people out, but they're going to think you did. Supernatural things happen when you are obedient to God. God answers things in ways you never thought were possible simply because of your what? Obedience. Now, the apostles didn't complain they were in jail. They were just there. And Christ set them three free through an angel because they needed to continue what? Sharing the gospel. Growing the kingdom. And so God opened doors that only man thought he could open. How many people are here today knowing that you got a job not because somebody hired you, because God wanted you there? He opened the door. He placed you there. Some of you are in homes, driving cars, because God wants you there. Some of you are in certain places and facilities doing certain types of work, not because you are a great person, but because that's where God feels that you will be most effective for Him. And until we take that serious, we will be effective nowhere. We have a tendency to pick and choose where we're going to serve God, and that's not how it works. We have to serve God here, just like we serve Him at work. Just like we serve him at home. Just like we serve him on the street. We have to give him full access all day, every day. They had been set free and now they've got to explain this that they can't find anybody. Verse 24. When the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. I just want to pause here real quick to say one thing. When you mess with God, you might ought to wonder what the outcome is going to be. When God moves, He moves with you, or He will move in spite of you. But there's no denying that it's God moving. And when God moves and you're against it, you can either get in line, or you can get out of the way. Because God's going to have His. Yes. This started getting in their minds, and it says, when someone came and told them, saying, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple teaching the people. They're going right back and doing what you told them not to do. Verse 26, then the captain <laughs> went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. They went to get them again, only this time they were real polite about it. Why? If people see you get locked up the day before, and they know you're in prison, and you're already up early the next day at the temple preaching, people got to wonder if there's something about these people. Now look, now look back. They were already laying people in Peter's shadow. They already were esteemed, and people knew these were men of God, women of God. And so they thought if they went and took them by force, the people would be an uprising, and they would stone the Sadducees. So they're like, hey, if you don't care, could you come on back? We'd like to talk with you guys. Change their tone. So they came. The apostles came willingly. And it says here in verse 27, when they had brought them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. You know what they were mad at him about? Because they were talking about Jesus. You see, Jesus had just been killed a few months earlier. And everybody knew what had happened. And this was continuing on the ministry of Jesus Christ. And because they were preaching and teaching in Jesus' name, that He was the Messiah, which went against everything that the Sadducees and the Pharisees believed and said, even though it was right there in front of them in their scrolls and in their scriptures, they didn't want to point that Christ as the Messiah. They didn't want to believe that Christ was the Son of God. And because they were using the name of Jesus and proclaiming the name of Jesus, that just wasn't good to them, and they told them to stop. I want to share something with you and see what you think about it. Did you know that nobody in society cares if you're going to help people who are less fortunate? You can give them food, and they say, thank you for doing that. You can give them clothing, they'll be like, good job, I'm glad you're doing that. You can help them get housing, you can help them get a job, you can start a recovery program. You can help people work their way back through these things, get back into society. You can give away free stuff and people will say, that is great, that is awesome. We are so glad you're doing that. They don't get mad until you try to tell them about Jesus. When you do it in the name of Jesus, people will always get mad and say, no, 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 you, you can't do that here. You, you, you got to be doing it. No, no. The Bible says everything we do in word and deed, we do it unto the Lord. And we do it in His name's sake. Amen. 
There is nothing greater than the cause of Christ for those in need and want. Because if we just bring people in and we just feed them and clothe them and we don't tell them about Jesus Christ and the good news of the Gospel, the forgiveness of sins, then basically we're sending people back out into the world into hell with full bellies and coats on. The world will always be mad when you point to Jesus. Point anyway. The world will always be mad when you mention Jesus. Mention Him anyway. Never be afraid because there is power just in that name. Peter answered in verse 29 and the other apostles said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Just to point out here, it wasn't Peter who said this. Peter wasn't by himself. He said we ought to obey God rather than men. And the rest of the apostles, it says in here, also said this likewise. It wasn't that they were following under one man's leadership. It's that each one of them was accountable to know that they were standing for God, from God. And they stood together boldly when they were focused on God and not necessarily the leadership of one man. Can you imagine how effective church would be if we got into the obedience of the Word of God and it drawed us together to a point where we were so united for a cause that all of us would answer the same thing saying, hey, we're here to obey God, not man. No matter what it will cost us and no matter what it will do to us. I may lose my freedom, but I am free on the other side of this life. And that's all that matters. You can beat me, you can take me, you can throw me in prison, but all of us are like, I, I would really not like something bad to happen to me. You see, I've got plans with my life. I want to live here. I want to build this house. I want to work in this industry. I want to drive this kind of car. I'd like to make this kind of money. And I'd like to meet someone. Do you know how many people I have counseled over the years whose whole knot in life was just finding somebody else? Did you ever think that maybe God doesn't want you to find anybody else? He's waiting for you to find Him or at least look. Yes. Because when you get with him, I promise you, he will put everybody in your life that needs to be there. And he will keep out no one that doesn't belong there. Our happiness should not be based on our trade, our income, where we live or how we live. And it should not be based on a, another person other than Jesus Christ. We should be sold out for him alone because all of us one day will have to answer to him alone. Verse 30, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus who you murdered by hanging on a tree. He basically told them what they've done. People get mad when you bring the truth around. You ever notice that? Holidays are coming up. Y'all be careful, okay? Somebody's liable to say something at the Thanksgiving table. Start an argument. Some of y'all start arguments before you go so you don't have to show up. <laughs> Christmas, same way. You're trying to get out of buying them gifts. I understand. Understand this. The truth needs to be told. Amen. Never hold back. Because it is the truth that changes everything. Jesus never watered down the truth. He simply spoke it, gave it, walked away. You either eat it or you leave it. But either way, he wasn't going to change it. He didn't change what he said just because he was around different people. He didn't change anything he said just because he's around different levels of society. The truth is what he spoke. And likewise, the truth is what we should teach, preach, Walk, talk, live, yes. and do. Verse 31, talking about Jesus. God is exalted to his right hand to be a prince and a savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those whom obey. Peter broke it down and said, look, we're with Jesus because of Jesus and we're here to teach repentance. And we're here to share that Jesus Christ is the key to forgiveness. And He is here for forgiveness for everyone. And that there's only one way into heaven. And so no matter what you do here today, we will never stop talking about Jesus. Amen. I asked you this morning, is that your lot in life? To never cease speaking about Jesus? I see a lot of people talk about sports. I see a lot of people talk about TV shows. I see a lot of people who can't wait till the next series of their show comes on. How about this? How about we get so hungry for the Word of God we can't wait till the next chapter?
to see what happens next. And if you've read the book, you ain't going to spoil it for nobody because we can sit here and say we know that God wins in the end. So yes. that's the side we need to be on. That's the son we need to be on. And that is the blood that sets all of us yeah. free. So if we're that focused, forget TV, forget sports, forget all these things that you think you have to have or need. I don't care if you're out of Wi-Fi. I don't care if the power goes out. You're down to candles. The Word of God will last forever and it'll take you further than you ever thought yeah. you could ever go. It is better than what the world has to offer and you should be willing to die for it and for the cause of it. Amen. Let's look at something here in verse 33. Gamaliel. <coughs> Gamaliel. When they heard this, they were furious and they plotted to kill them. Have you ever noticed that the Pharisees and Sadducees when someone went against them, what did they do? Let's just kill them. <laughs> they didn't like trying to do anything. Let's just kill them. And apparently they had some good plots going on because they killed several people in Scripture. They also killed several people in history. This was kind of like their M.O. Hey, if you're against us, let's just kill them and get them out of the way. A lot of people think that because someone is in your way, some kind of interference, some kind of obstruction, that you're like, Lord, if you could just smite them. I could, I could do better for you. No, sometimes God puts them in your path because that's who he wants you to witness to. That's who he wants you to witness to, share the gospel with, and love on. Because it's a whole lot harder to love somebody we don't like. Some of y'all know what I mean. Y'all been married a while. It is hard to love someone you don't like. But scripture never tells us we have to like people. It says we have to love people. Amen. And all of us are different. We may not always agree on everything in the world but we need to agree on everything in the scripture and what we don't agree on, leave it to God because it is faith that will teach us, obedience that will show us and the Holy Spirit that will seal us. This fired them up and they wanted to kill them. And then it said in verse 34, one of the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people. So this was one of those religious folk who people actually liked and listened to, and he was very well respected. He had a great reputation, and he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him, and he was slain. And all who obeyed were scattered, and they came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of census, and he drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. The same thing holds true today. Never get jealous, upset, or nasty because you see large crowds gathering in certain places for certain things. I don't care if it's church. I don't care if it's a political affiliation. I don't care anything where you see large groups of people because might doesn't make right. Just because there's many doesn't mean that they're true. And whatever is of man will always dwindle and fizzle out but everything from God cannot and will not be stopped. Amen. Let me tell you something about Gamaliel. History tells us that not only he was esteemed and respected, he was a very smart man. Because he did not rush into decisions. He thought about them. He had seen evidence and he simply reported to this sect of the Sadducees, hey, this ain't the first time we've seen some uprising of some people. And guess what? It dwindled out. Leave them alone. But if this is true, there's nothing you're going to do now that will ever stop it in the future. And you know what? Not only was that true, because we're still living and breathing and talking about what? Yeah. Jesus Christ today in 2020. The answer has never changed to the ultimate question asked, what is the purpose of life? To be born again, set free, and go to live in heaven with our Creator God one day, forever and ever and ever. Amen. And to shout glory, Amen. glory, yes. glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That is the lot in life. And while we are here, we are to be obedient in all we do, knowing that wherever the world tries to stop it, you will never contain God. And God's will will come to pass. Amen. Last I want to share with you about Gamaliel here. 
History shows us that he was a spiritual father and mentor to a guy named Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus later became Paul on the road to Damascus. If you don't think God puts people in your path for a reason, this ought to give you hope in that. Gamaliel was the one who trained up Saul, who eventually became Paul. And Paul was a thinker. Paul never said, I don't want to do this anymore. He knew that what God had began, he could never stop. And so he said, to live is Christ, to die is what? Gain. Shouldn't that be all of our lot in life? To be so committed to the word and will of God that no matter where it takes us or no matter how it breaks us, we would never shy away. We would never draw back. We would let God have his way. Let's finish up here. Verse 41. I'm sorry, verse 40. It's getting good here. <laughs> oh. And they agreed with him. They agreed with Gamaliel. The Sadducees are like, you know what? You're right. That's a good idea. And then they called for the apostles. Brought them back in the room. What's it say in your verse next? And they beat them. Notice they didn't. They, remember they went and got him, and they didn't want to get stoned by the people. It was like, hey, you can, come, can you come back and talk? And they come and like, we're going to set you outside. We're going to talk about this for a minute. All right, we're going to let you go. And you think to yourself, "Woo, we made it through. And then they just beat you. It said that they beat them, and then they commanded them. You should never speak in the name of Jesus. Then they let them go. Isn't it amazing how many Christians will sit here today and they will say, Please, God, don't let this happen to me. Don't ever let anything bad happen to me. They don't ever want to go through anything. They always whine. They always complain. There's always a struggle. Never give glory to God. It's just if you ask them, you know, these people are like, how's it going? They're like, well, you know what? You ever saw people like that? They never once say, I'm doing great. Or God is awesome. They're like, well, you know, uh, it's one thing after another. Because somehow they thought that following God and being saved and born again was going to mean automatically that you never go through anything. Not only does it mean you go through stuff, you go through more. They persecuted Jesus. They're going to persecute you. And just because these apostles were set free, it didn't mean they left without a scratch. They beat them. And then they forbid them. Never talk about Jesus Christ ever again. I don't know what your response would be. I don't take kindly to someone beating on me. I probably would have swung back on a few, you know. Hey, I'm that way. I'm like, hey, you know, I'm reformed. I'm going to use that word. I'm reformed. But I will punch somebody. I will punch somebody. Yeah, I'm from the south side of the kingdom. Yeah. I will punch somebody. Now, listen to how the, uh, the apostles reacted. So they departed from the presence of the council with a fresh beating, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the shame and in the name of Jesus Christ. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They were in jail. They got let go and went right back to what? The very thing they got arrested doing. They called them back, got mercy, got let go, still beat, and then forbade to talk about it, and they came out rejoicing. I don't know anybody that's ever got up from a butt whooping and said, thank you for doing that, I needed that. <laughs> no one. If anything, it will make you stop and think about whether you should do that again. For instance, for those of us who have disciplined our children in the past because that's the way we were disciplined, our parents did not whip us to encourage us to keep doing that, did they? They did that to make us what? Stop. And so we automatically correlate that somehow punishment means to quit or maybe we shouldn't be doing this. 
In Christianity, it's the exact opposite. If you're getting a beating, a physical or a spiritual beating, if you're going through a hard time, I promise you because God has got something big around the corner yes. and the enemy's trying to get you to stop and not pursue it because when you get there, not only are you going to get a breakthrough, you're going to level up in a way and grow your faith like you've never known it. You'll start being like Peter. Maybe you start out loud and crazy, but you end up believing Jesus enough that you can walk on water in the middle of the storm. And even when you forget that you were with Christ and deny it, you can get restored. And guess what? The Holy Spirit will speak through you enough that people are healed just by you casting a shadow. That's the glory of God. Quit dropping your head and saying, woe is me. And you say, woe, glory to God because of you. Yes. It's because of you alone that I can walk and talk today. I can breathe today. I have freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. Since when did the church become so feeble and meek? Since when are we ever told in Scripture, we are to love, but we are not to tolerate sin. We are to be a place for all whosoever, but we are not to be manipulated by the world. We're not even to look like the world. We're supposed to be so sanctified and set apart that the world looks it up and be like, oh, it's in Christians. It's in disciples. If I put you in a lineup, with the crowd of people that were at Western's ball game yesterday, could I pick you out as a Christian or a Hilltopper fan? And some of y'all are saying, well, we could be both. I'll get you there. But we're looking for Christians. I want to say something. And, and uh, I mean it in the utmost love and respect that I can say it. But I can't be nothing but honest with you. 2020 has showed us who's devoted and who's not. I ain't talking about a virus. I ain't talking about a presidential election. I'm talking about whether you're in it for self or you're in it for Savior. Because if you're in it for the Savior, you won't hesitate to tell somebody else. When they say you can't go, you'll go anyway. When they tell you not to talk about it, you'll talk anyway. You'll live that way because you know what? You know that you've been set free for a different reason than your own. You've been set free to share the gospel. And that's exactly what the first church did. They didn't have a building. They didn't have overhead. They met everywhere they could. And it said they met daily and they never ceased preaching, teaching, and talking about what? Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the answer no matter the question, no matter the problem. And if we ever get to a point that if we go right back into lockdown again, I hope you're around some good people who love to talk about Jesus Christ while they're in your home. I hope you don't stop reading the Word. I hope you don't think the church just happens in a building. You can have it at your house. You don't have to be a pastor, a preacher, or a teacher. You can open the Word of God, get into prayer, let the Spirit come in, and God will teach you. God will show you. God will be right there. He will be with you as long as you are praising Him, praying Him, and in His Word. Amen. No matter what comes. If it all goes haywire one day, and we don't see each other for a while, pack your book, pack your heart. No matter what this world dishes out, Jesus Christ bore it all on the cross, and it has been paid in yes. full. Amen. You owe this world nothing except the good news of the gospel, Amen. the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And refusing to move when you know where God stands. Let's pray. Father, I pray for peace in the lives of these people. I pray for wisdom. I pray for knowledge. And I pray for understanding of your word. I pray for courage. And I pray for faith. I pray for people willing to speak out. To reach out and to live out. Everything you've modeled for us to do. Lord, as we look at the acts of the apostles, we are called to do the same thing. There is no variation. We are not only to live with one another and be around one another and take care of one another, but we are to bear one another's burdens. Men and women speaking, preaching, teaching about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the Savior of the world, the one who came to take away our sin, that only through Him can we be born again and receive the promise of heaven. It won't make us perfect, 
but it will bring us to conviction. And repentance is what will change us. Day in and day out, knowing that where we fail, you will fill us right back up. Lord, maybe we're not going to stand up on a street corner and give a speech, but we can be a friend in a break room. We can give hope at a gas station. We can share good news at the grocery store. We can build a home on the foundation of Jesus Christ and not just out of the passion and attraction of opposite sex. Lord, forgive us for sending our kids to public school and then wondering why they act like the rest of the world rather than us bringing them up. Christian values that no matter what they run into outside, they'll know the truth. As we train them children up when they're old, they will not depart from them. Lord, forgive us where we thought church was a building. And that we could ever be stopped by whoever became president. Or that it could ever be stopped by a virus, a sickness, an illness, or disease. Lord, the truth is you're in control of it all. So Lord, give us faith and give us courage. Let us be devoted that we would proclaim no matter what. If we lose it all here, remind us that we've gained it all there. If it takes us to prison, so be it. If it takes us to another country, so be it. If we lose friends and family, so be it. But let us share the hope that is in your word. The forgiveness that is in your truth and the life-changing gospel that caused the lost to be found. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.